good evening uh, everyone uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, siddhant das with us today siddhant is at the anal sommerfeld center of uh, lmu that's the ludwig maximilian university in munich and he recently obtained his phd from lmu with the detlef duer and you as many of you know unfortunately in 20, early 2021 detlef uh, uh, unfortunately passed away because of i think a covid illness but uh, before that fortunately both siddhant and uh, detlef had completed some very important and i think consequential work on the quantum uh, arrival time problem in quantum mechanics and uh, especially comparing the arrival time problem in bohmian mechanics with that in conventional quantum mechanics so in these uh, years uh, during and following his phd siddhant has thought deeply about uh, various aspects of quantum theory foundational aspects uh, with a special interest in uh, uh, bohmian mechanics and uh, we are very much looking forward to your talk siddhant over to you oh thank you so much for the generous introduction i i should clarify that i still didn't get the phd even though i have started a new position in a different group um so now i am based so previously i was in the maths department of lmu now i am part of the chair of computational and plasma physics which is itself part of this bigger consortium called arnold sommerfeld center in any case i still have lot of opportunity to continue working on this exciting subject Uh, before i begin the talk i want to thank the organizers tp singh and michael right for inviting me it's really a nice curated online lecture series thanks to the archive trust and ayuka pune for supporting this event thanks to everyone who is here thanks for taking interest in this talk and for your time and of course the last token of gratitude will go to uh detlef my beloved supervisor who inspires me even today in his own unique way and the work that i'm going to talk about uh largely is based on what we did together uh and maybe very minor developments of it after uh, after he passed away unfortunately uh for those who are interested here is a memorial piece i wrote it's just recently so you can look it up on archive if you're interested in personal anecdotes and and so on okay um so i'll just begin so i i guess the talk is for about an hour and then we go into discussions i mean i hope i finish in one hour but if we don't it's really not necessary that i have to go through all the slides also have some extra slides in case there are questions on some of uh, some topics in any case the whole talk is about uh, arrival time or time of flight experiments uh, which are very common actually so i will give uh, actual experimental examples as we go along but schematically and this slide should set the whole context of the talk and uh, what my experience is has been that some some of the controversial discussion that erupts uh, can often be clarified if we get the main message or the requirement that is laid in this slide so what's here so the experiment is as many of you have imagined as the name time of flight suggests you have quantum particle prepared in some known or definite state denoted psi 0 here schematically you can imagine it's surrounded by detectors like scintillation screens geiger counter you know there are a few options out there and the whole interest is in the time at which you see the click or you hear the click you know so that's why the the title of this slide is when does the detector click it's a age old question that quantum physicists have been interested in 
And the idea, of course, is in the end to make a prediction for the distribution of the in time instance at which these clicks occur. And, uh, you know, this is just called time of flight in the experimental literature. Uh, I'm denoting it by TF. So the time post preparation is TF, which can be supplied by an actual experiment. If you repeat the experiment by doing by preparing the particle identically again and again, you expect a random sequence of TFs. And what's expected, at least from a theorist, is to make a clean prediction for the distribution of these time of flights. So I'll just be calling it the time of flight distribution um, for most of the talk, OK? And it's, of course, as a probability distribution has its nat natural interpretation, which is, you know, if you integrate it to get probabilities of clicks between time t1 and t2 and so on. And it's expected to be normalized as, as usual. There's one small subtlety I might as well clarify here. So in this normalization condition, you can see a p infinity sitting there on the left. And that uh, becomes relevant once we start going into more realistic experimental situations. This p infinity is introduced to account for non-detection events. So in those experimental runs where you don't see a click, you are obviously not in a position to define the time of flight and therefore all the so the fraction of those experiments is just p infinity or the non-detection probability. So that then makes so the normalization condition is adjusted to take that into account. In any case, as I said, time of flight experiments are all over physics. If you get into experimental literature, you see them in all fields of physics, all subfields of physics, from condensed matter physics to atomic physics to particle physics, especially because uh, people measure time of flight to to basically reconstruct other quantities out of it. You know, famously, energy and momentum. In a condensed matter sector, you ha you have people reporting band structure of solids by this famous technique called RPS TOF. Uh, chemists, uh, quantum chemists are very much measuring arrival times, even at the single molecular level, to study different aspects of chemical reactions. And ion trappers and BEC physicists often <laughs> try to report a temperature when doing a time of flight experiment. So I wouldn't go into great detail about any of these particular techniques. If there is interest, we could surely uh, discuss in the discussion section, but this is just to give you a flavor of why we should be interested in these kind of experiments, because they matter uh, for so much of physics around us. Okay. Uh, I thought a few remarks from prominent physicists could set the mood. I mean, the same physicists will again appear later, maybe saying something else. Uh, early on, actually, 1925, as you can see, that's even before the Schrodinger equation, you, you hear prominent physicists talking about such quantities, like, you know, not just arrival time, but there's a lot of interest in the photoelectric effect and the time statistics of the ejected electrons, like when are the electrons being emitted. So... So in a letter, so I can read out initial quotes and later if I run out of time, I would just skip reading them. And maybe when you see it online, you could just pause and read peacefully. So here Pauli is saying perhaps the following points in, in the right direction. Per, this is actually a translation from German. So it's as accurate as, as it gets. I mean, I got it from a colleague whom I trust very much. In any case, he is complaining that in the theory of matrix mechanics, um, there is no description of the time instance of the transition processes. And he believes that these are certainly observable. And for example, he says the instance of ejections of electrons in the photoelectric effect. And so he's concerned that the theory is not mature enough to deal with these quantities. And then later on, you see in Feynman and Hibbs, the famous path integral textbook, uh, I think in the second chapter where he's trying to relate the formalism with actual experimental uh, 
like actual experiments, he's saying, you know, all me measurements of quantum mechanical systems could be made to reduce to eventually to position and time measurements. Example, the position of a needle on a meter or the time of flight of a particle. And surely as a particle physicist, Feynman knows how much time of flight matters for many of the important particle physics experiments. Um, for those who are interested, you can actually go to CERN's webpage and they have huge book logs describing their time of flight detectors. I mean, they're very crucial for many of the experiments. Um, okay, now the problem. The quantum arrival time problem, as it's being called uh, largely. Uh, the problem is actually very simple to state. Uh, the problem is that there is a widespread disagreement about what quantum mechanics predicts as a theory for this quantity, which is of interest, the distribution of time of light. And, you know, that's just a true statement because the literature is full of competing predictions. I believe about 20 or so uh, as, as we speak. And and the, his, and the efforts to finding this has been wrought with a lot of uh, pessimistic and negative uh, conclusions by eminent physicists. I mean, I just picked up two just for flavor. There are so many of them. Uh, Alcock has written very nice three-part paper, like each one is roughly you know, 100, 200 page long. And he goes into great detail into the study of time of flight experiments and how to come up with a theoretical prediction for the time of flight distribution. More or less, in the end, he concludes uh, that wave mechanics cannot accommodate an exact and ideal arrival time concept. Then uh, in the late 90s, you have Aharonov and other known colleagues saying time of arrival cannot be precisely defined and measured in quantum mechanics. And of course, all of these authors are basing their conclusions on some considerations. And to really <laughs> do justice to them, we should uh, get into the details. But this is just to give you a flavor for how this field has developed a bit over time. Um, I also want to add this last piece into the arrival time into the quantum arrival time problem. It's mostly presented as a presented as a theoretical problem, which I have just described, uh, namely the disagreement in coming up with a prediction. But it's but I also feel that in experiments, uh, since time of flight is being measured, I try to convince you. It, it's a this should raise some red flags as to what are the what kind of theory is the experimental work relying on in order to interpret the measurements and i think that should also be seen as part of the arrival time problem especially one should be concerned that if i'm constructing a quantity of interest out of arrival time data and the latter let's say is well defined in quantum mechanics while for time of flight we have so much disagreement we should really be worried about these reconstruction procedures, right? Okay, so this is just a few remarks on what's the arrival time problem, both in theory and experiment. So I have surveyed many of the available proposals in quite some detail in this talk. So if you go to YouTube and just uh, right, can we fix quantum arrival times before 2026? You might, you know, find this talk, which talks about most of the approaches out there. Today, I'm going to talk about very few and mostly the approach which comes from, which is grounded in Bohmian mechanics or pilot wave theory. Uh, but for anybody interested, you can visit this talk as well. Now, as I said, there are all these approaches out there. One could study them individually. But what's also uh, striking is many physicists are really not satisfied with the proposals that are on the table. I've just listed, I mean, I, I'm certainly one of them, but there are others who have written papers about, you know, complaining about the available ideas, either showing that they're unphysical or, you know, 
violate some cherished principle or the other and so on. Uh, now, in this situation, it would be helpful if there were experimental guidance, but unfortunately, there is not the quality of experimental data that could really, you know, which could be brought to bear on this discussion is not available at present. And much of what's happening in the la laboratories are, you know, at the moment, more or less, you know, explain, you could explain them using semi-classical heuristics or geometric optics insight, or just experience and good taste as Bell would say. So, so we, we need new experiments to really inform this debate here. Okay. Often at this point, many listeners are wondering, you know, I have the wave function. Why can I just square it? Isn't that somehow going to give me the arrival time distribution? I mean, this is a very common guess, guess uh, when you talk about this subject with physicists. Uh, so I want to discuss that a little bit and right in the beginning. So imagine that the arrival time distribution is somehow proportional to this square of the wave function. So psi of r and t is just the wave function at time t, you know, which you would get by solving Schrodinger equation with the prepared wave function, right? So solving the Schrodinger equation part is fine. Question is, can this be a legitimate arrival time distribution? And and if you are one of those who was thinking this to yourself, then you are in good company because there is quite a good number of physicists who said it in print. I've just named them. I put a, first of all, I have the proportionality sign there and not an equal to for reasons. And first of all, that quantity on the right hand side doesn't even have the right dimensions of an arrival time distribution. And why is that? And that's again in the first slide, because we want the final distribution to be normalized in this form. So it has to have the physical dimensions of one over time, which is not the case. Uh, if we take the usual, you know, L2 normalized wave function, satisfying the Schrodinger equation. But dimension is not the problem. The other thing is this quantity has serious problems if it were to be taken seriously as an arrival time distribution. And one of them we can just see right away by taking a very simple example and trying to plug it in into that, that kind of formula. So take, for example, the Gaussian, the well-known Gaussian wave packet solution for the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. And if you square it, of course, you have to substitute T for Tf. You see that this quantity decays very slowly in Tf. So it's, it's of course, normalized in X, which is how we use it all the time. Uh, but it's, it's not even normalizable in this time variable. So it's already you know, raises some red flags. Um, uh, maybe this is also helpful. Uh, we don't have to go into this in great detail, but in the field of stochastics, and uh, there's an analogous problem that's very popular. Many of you might have come across this. You know, people are interested in the so-called first passage time of a diffusing particle or a Brownian particle or some other stochastic motion of interest. And there you have uh, a density, a position density at a given time, which is changing with time basically, uh, and which is analogous to the square of the wave function. It, it has the same job in, uh, in Brownian motion theory. Uh, and in, in this field, one can talk about the first passage time or arrival time of a Brownian particle at a fixed point, let me call it L. And uh, people have figured out these distributions for a long time now. Uh, in the case of this simple 1D diffusion, the arrival time or first passage time distribution is given by this thing which I've put in, which I've highlighted. It's the famous Levy distribution. It looks close to this density. So one might still wonder if I know this guy, maybe there is a way to achieve uh, arrival time like object with the right properties. Um, but maybe the simple example is a bit of an illusion. In general, actually, it's not possible to reconstruct the arrival time distribution from the position distribution at a fixed time. 
So if you know the position statistics at all the times, it's not sufficient to reconstruct the arrival time distribution in a very safe territory, uh, namely that of Brownian motion. Uh, and there are examples, you know, if you look at, for example, or onstein henbeck process, then I don't think one even knows uh, expression for the first passage time, even though the expression for the density you can find on Wikipedia. So uh, one has to be careful with analogies, but this gives you some ideas as to what quantities even have the scope for being the arrival time distribution if we are starting clueless, let's say. Okay, uh, let's uh, get a little more quantum mechanical. As, as we are told, to predict outcomes of experiments, we need a quantum observer. I mean, that's typically the scheme in which the quantum textbooks are written, that's what we teach, and so on. But unfortunately, uh, there is no observable for such a quantity in the books, right? And otherwise, it would be known to all of us. It's a very basic quantity, as it seems from the experimental point of view. Now, there are, I mean, the, the, the reason for that is no such observable is at the moment uh, being agreed upon by the physicists working in this field and who are approaching it from a more orthodox uh, perspective. But historically, a lot of roadblocks showed up in this route in uh, those who try to find time observables. And Pauli, again, is a well-known name that comes up in this business. And Alcock also, whom I mentioned before, they found, basically they realized that it's really hard to come up with a time operator which has the right kind of properties. I mean, um, I mean one of the things they noticed is, you know, if you, if you have an arrival time operator which has eigenstates, which are labeled by the, you know, the time of flight eigenvalue, if you like, it is expected to have certain time translation properties uh, just by the nature of the arrival time concept. I mean, I I'm trying to keep it very loose because I don't want to get into the very technical details of these theorems. I mean, they're out there in the literature and I'll give you references. And since time translation is generated by the Hamiltonian, the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, you know, creates problems for defining this time of flight eigenstates, if you like. So, so this is a very technical literature and people have produced uh, theorems which are more stricter and so on. But by far, there is, I think there's a widespread understanding now that finding a self-adjoint uh, Hermitian in physics terms operator, which can, on which you can base your time of flight predictions for these kind of experiments, uh, seems to have been hopeless. People agree that that's not possible in the light of these kind of no-go theories. Okay. Uh, that's not a showstopper because the concept of an observable has now been generalized to accommodate things like positive operator value measures and so on. So much of the work in this area now concerns trying to find positive operator valued measures and not self-adjoint operators because of these no-go theorems. And of course, these results have filtered into textbooks. For instance, you must have heard the remark, the time is just a parameter in quantum mechanics, it's not an observable. So this quote is from Sakurai. Um, I don't know now which one, probably modern quantum mechanics. It's chapter three, I think, time evolution. He says it is nonsensical to talk about the time operator in the same sense as we talk about the position operator. Okay. Uh, actually, these no-go result, results had a strong uh, hold in this field, and for many years, they really discouraged people from trying to do anything about it. As you can see, it's, I mean, Rikami, who passed away, I think, last year, he, he noted that this stopped work for about 40 years. Okay. Let us try to uh, dive a little uh, deeper into this issue. I want to just give you a flavor for what kind of problems come up if you're trying to find a arrival time operator in, a, in this traditional way. Well, first of all, what's the starting point? I mean, one goes to classical physics because where time of flight arrival time is 
clearly defined. Let's take free motion, the simplest of all situations. And in that case, you know what's the time of flight of a particle which starts at a point X with momentum P and has to arrive at a point L or has to cover a distance L from the origin. Then we know the time of flight is just distance by the speed. And to get anything quantum mechanical out of this, one invokes canonical quantization, that is to promote this object into an operator. And immediately there are problems here because since X and P do not commute, there are ordering ambiguities. And even more seriously in this case, because you have a one by P there, defining that operator in the usual Hilbert space needs a lot of care and attention. I mean, this talk, I'm not going to be discussing that in much detail. I'll give you a nice reference where you can look these things up if you're mathematically very interested. But uh, nonetheless, this kind of operator, which is you know what physicists usually do, they take the symmetric quantization, uh, appeared in 1960s. I mean, there's a physical review paper by Haranov Bohm and a German one by Wolfgang Paul. And as far as I remember, they, they are trying to estimate uncertainties, basically. They are really interested in the time energy uncertainty relation, trying to give it a more firm mathematical footing than is available. And that's mainly their interest. So they're not even really interested in the entire arrival time distribution. They are considering this object in so far as it helps them to estimate uncertainties. And so, so it's 1960s, so early for all these mathematical uh, discussions. In any case, they saw that this operator has the right kind of properties, like, uh, you know, it commutes with the free Hamiltonian, like energy and time operator. So it already suggests that you might get an uncertainty relation. I put a question mark there because I'm going to clarify that very quickly. A uh, lot of work has gone into this. And, and, and as I said, because of these no-go theorems, this operator, even though it looks kind of self-adjoint, it is not, and it has to do with these mathematical technical points. Uh, in any case, this operator can be used to find eigenstates, which are not pairwise orthogonal, as you would like for a Hermes, uh, for a self-adjoint operator. But uh, uh, one ends up defining a POVM. I mean, one should be a bit careful because there are domain issues. These are really glossed over in the literature. Uh, again, I want to keep this talk not very mathematically heavy. But one nice takeaway here is even though there are a lot of issues here, mathematical issues, in the end, there is at least a candidate arrival time distribution, which looks somewhat quantum mechanically principled. And at least it could be used for experiment for comparing with observations. So that's the best takeaway at the moment. Uh, interest in this operator grew when Kijowski actually found a very innovative derivation of the same distribution. He actually derived it by making, by uh, making, uh, sorry, by helping himself to some axioms, some natural axioms. I have some extra slides if anybody's interested in those axioms. There's a very, very interesting derivation. So he's actually coming up with a prediction from, you know, from some uh, symmetry arguments like coming from Galilean invariance and geometry of the screen. In any case, uh, he managed to only handle the free motion case that for an infinite screen, for a flat screen. So if you were to play with the geometry of the screen or if you were to introduce external potentials, neither the putting hats on classical expression mode nor the axiomatic approach goes any far. You can see it for yourself. There's really not much scope here because once you have even simple potentials, the Newtonian mechanics itself is quite involved and you cannot expect to get an expression for the arrival time of the particle defined on all possible initial conditions ready for you to put hats on it. So, you know, this, this program, as far as I can see in these years, hasn't moved too far, at least not far enough to be compared against experiments, which inevitably involve external potentials and so on. Um, sorry, I was going in the other direction. 
there are other problems i mean i don't want to spend too much time critiquing this particular distribution i mean but one thing which is very striking is it even it assigns probabilities to negative arrival times uh, this has not been really discussed or clarified what kind of meaning can we associate like supposing you prepare a particle at an instant and call it zero or t not and you see a click later that click is not going to happen in a real experiment before the time you prepare the particle so it's it's quite unclear what these negative arrival times mean and there's also one strange result that this distribution would predict uh, a vanishing expectation value for the time of flight for any real wave function so if you had a nice gaussian without any velocity and have a detector at a distance uh, for that kind of wave function this will give you zero for the mean arrival time which is kind of strange right when do you get zero for the mean arrival time if every arrival is instantaneous you would expect right okay so there are all these issues again domain issues uh, may come up meaning not all kinds of wave functions can be incorporated into this framework for instance it excludes because of that one over p basically sitting in that operator so the way it acts on different initial wave functions uh, creates problems uh, for instance the gaussian wave packet is strictly not in the domain of this operator and so on which is kind of very sad okay um, as i said there are a lot of roadblocks to going through with this kind of a program into more realistic situations um, especially you know the the most serious problem i feel is the limitations to incorporating external electromagnetic potentials basically for instance at the moment there is no operator even of the pobm kind as far as i know which can handle external magnetic fields uh, meaning yeah i mean if you imagine an experiment where a particle is moving in a constant magnetic field and you use any of these proposals and make some naive generalizations you would get uh, non gauge invariant results and those are not physical predictions so all this stuff that i was saying rather very quickly and without too much care can be looked up in this paper from a few years ago here there are all the details that you might be interested in and all the references to to the physicists who work on this okay uh basically these slides for me are kind of discouraging and i hope for the, for you as a listener uh so interest naturally shifts in this field to non operator avenues right uh i just took some quotes again from bohm and feynman who were brave enough to make strong statements against operators for example i'll read out these quotes so bohm said in one of his 1953 papers i mean this was he was defending his theory which we will talk about much more in the next minutes uh, he he was saying the significance of the quantum observables uh, in his opinion has been exaggerated in the sense that elements entering as useful mathematical techniques have been raised to the level of fundamental concepts in the physical theory that's his uh, view on the use of operators in quantum mechanics a feynman also vehemently uh, disparaged operators for instance uh, this is not a direct quote this is reported by david hastings i think he says so I, he was a student of feynman so this is from a lecture i believe where he has said if anyone tells me that to every observable there corresponds a hermitian operator this is feynman for which the eigen values correspond to observed values i will defeat him i will cut his feet off so these are very provocative statements in any case uh, moving towards alternative ways to handle arrival times it would really be nice if we had some our quantum theories featuring particle trajectories because you know as our discussion must have suggested that the notion of arrival time is very naturally associated with the notion of trajectories i'm not suggesting that we need trajectories to be able to do arrival time but if quantum theories could provide trajectories as a resource 
that would be very helpful because at least you would have particles moving along trajectories and you know there's something that's arriving and you could study the arrival times so and of course we do have such theories uh, the crowd that's present here is familiar with the names for sure i would give brief introductions um to to bohm's theory of a uh, little later but on in the outset i would like to say that given what i just said very briefly uh you know you one begins to appreciate the value of you know this trajectory containing quantum theories which give you new tools new resources to handle uh problems of experimental interest uh and don't you know leave you to be guessing a self urgent operator or fighting the math for years and years and often coming up with just a negative result so i want to promote or maybe try to convince you that uh there is re there is good reason to take interest in these alternative uh ways of doing quantum statistics coming from trajectory containing quantum theories and with that let me give a very quick um uh, yeah i mean let me call it an introduction to bohm's theory i mean there is no way i can do justice to it in the in the time i have but still i believe not not everybody may might be will be familiar familiar with it so it's helpful to at least lay out the basic uh, framework of this theory so so historically of course it is as old as regular quantum mechanics the earliest ideas go back to de broglie even einstein to some extent in any case one thing to say would be in the standard quantum framework that we teach and use almost regularly the description is uh completely in terms of the wave function and there is a i mean if not explicitly there is an understanding that there is nothing more to add that you know one calls it the quantum state which is like a complete specification of the physical state of affairs as it were now at this point already the the pilot wave theory of de broglie and bohm um uh, already departs because they supplement i mean that's probably not a fair characterization i mean their theory has actual physical particles particles are taken seriously and their motion is given a definitive equation so all the particles evolve according to a definitive equation of motion and this equation of motion is you know carefully designed which makes it compatible with the known results of quantum mechanics i mean that might also make make may that may also make it sound like it's a bit conspiratorial but i would try to tell you that the equations that are written down there so of i mean in a sense obvious that if you spend perhaps 20 minutes thinking about it perhaps you will even come up with it yourself so that's why the the actual equations were derived by different people over the years in different ways i mean derivation is a very strong word but people came up with those equations which i'm going to show you now so in the in this theory and i'm just presenting a particle version because that's what i would need mostly for my uh purposes here so here you have a wave function if you have n particles uh and of course there are the actual trajectories which i denote with capital letters um sorry there is a glitch here okay uh the wave function always evolves by wave equation it could be schrodinger pauli dirac as the case may be depending on the particles and then there is a equation of motion ordinary differential equation for the trajectories these are the so called bohmian trajectories um and the theory is of course specified once we give these hamiltonian operators and these velocity fields and as always in physics these are educated guesses coming from various considerations of symmetries uh, you know non relativistic relativistic considerations uh, experimental input and various other things uh, 
So there is strictly no derivation of it, but over time it's quite clear what these objects need to be for the particles we are interested in. Okay, so it's deterministic dynamics. The wave function as well as the particles move deterministically. Nevertheless, quantum randomness and all the quantum predictions can be derived by a careful analysis of these dynamics, by a statistical analysis of this deterministic dynamics. Okay. Uh, some of you may have come across these equations. These are well-known examples applicable for a single spin zero particle. So the Schrodinger equation, of course, everybody knows, and the guiding equation, uh, I think, also is familiar to most of you. Okay, so if you specify initial conditions, uh, the solutions of this equation is unique. So the trajectory that you get is postulated to be the path of an actual physical corpuscle, like point-like particle. And its motion basically gives you all this wave particle phenomena. So let's look at a few. Uh, and today, of course, a lot of beautiful simulations are available and, you know, just a Google search away. I thought I will show you the um, double slit uh, trajectories. I mean, you cannot give a talk on Bohm's theory without showing these pictures. Uh, but before getting into the pictures, I want to emphasize again that it's not just for, you know, our mental satisfaction or for telling a story under, underlying the quantum phenomena, but you can actually reproduce the quantitative uh, predictions that we get from the operator formalism. And uh, there is literature that you could look up if you're interested in, in this. Okay, so these are the famous uh, double slit trajectories. Michael, you should tell Basel that I advertise it very much. Uh, so these, as far as I know, the first time these uh, trajectories appeared in the late 70s uh, from Basil Hailey uh, and, his, and his students who computed these, Chris Philippides and Chris Dudney, and they have a very special place in the discussion of Bohm's theory. Of course, over time, much, uh, uh, you know, let's say more realistic versions where the slits and all are modeled more realistically have come up. In any case, the picture says it all. The idea is particles individually are propagating along these trajectories. Each track is the possible history of a quantum particle crossing the slits. Every particle goes through one slit at a time and the dynamics is so that they get channeled into these bands, which then give us the interference pattern. It's kind of clear, right? Uh, this is a well-known bell quote. He was very uh, romantically summarizing this picture. Maybe I'll read this one. Uh, he says, is it not clear from the smallness of the scintillation on the screen that we have to do with a particle? And is it not clear from the diffraction and interference pattern that the motion of the particle is directed by a wave? And then he says, de Broglie shows, showed in detail how the motion of a particle passing through just one of the two holes in a screen could be influenced by waves propagating through both holes and so influenced that the particle does not go where the waves cancel out but is attracted to where they cooperate. So it's very typical characteristic bell. Uh, as you know, he was a great defender and supporter of Bohm and de Broglie's theories. And uh, I recommend his The Impossible Pilot Wave. That's a good introduction if you have not come across this uh, this theory before. Uh, okay, I mean, this slide is usually just to tell people that yes, you can have particle trajectories and still explain interference experiments, even though claims to the contrary have been made in the literature by important people. It's just wrong. It's explicitly clear from these pictures. These are solutions of actual equations which can reproduce experimental predictions. Anyways, I don't have to persuade you more about the about the theory here. Uh, I'm just adding one more illustration just uh, to show something new. Uh, how about tunneling phenomena? If you had particle described by a Gaussian wave packet uh, colliding with a barrier, you know we know that in certain runs of the experiment it goes through the barrier, in certain others it doesn't. It gets reflected, 
and that comes out very clearly from from solving these guiding equations with the appropriate solution of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, for instance, you get uh, these kind of trajectories. So this is a displacement time graph. So it's a one dimensional particle. So it's motion is along the vertical axis. Time is along horizontal axis. A bunch of traje trajectories have been rendered together. Each trajectory would be, you know, one would represent one single run of the, ex of the tunneling experiment, let's say. So the position of the barrier is around the origin. It's a static barrier, so its position does not change with time. And you can see some trajectories go through, some reflect off. And Travis Norson has a nice paper I can recommend here in AMJFIS, where he gives some nice, uh, uh, so he gives uh, some nice conditions on which go, trajectories go through and which do not, it's, it's quite nice. So here is a close-up of these trajectories. Okay, so enough of uh, trying to explore the theory. It's, it's really a, not a very fair exposition, I must admit, but it, it's enough for the kind of uh, purposes, for my purposes here. And I, again, highly recommend all the, you know, standard textbooks and literature on this. So these, these guys, you know, it's a lot of material and, makes great read. In any case, just like we cannot learn Newtonian mechanics by just seeing the pictures of planetary orbits, even this theory being mechanics, um, you know, invites a lot of engagement and spending time. So those who are interested, you are most welcome. Okay, so let's uh, come back to arrival time. So in these kind of theories, since we have particle trajectories, it's uh, and and the way I was trying to explain these experiments, the scattering experiments, double slit and tunneling and so on, uh, it's it's very much suggestive that the time at which the trajectory strikes a certain location defining the screen would be the time of detection. I mean, I'm being careful because uh, people sometimes dispute this as a proposal. But in any case, it is something that is very well defined. I've written it down here. So this is giving you the, this is actually the first crossing time. So it's analogous to what I had written for the Brownian motion. So for example, in the double slit experiment, if you were to ask what's the time at which one of these trajectories strikes uh, the screen, uh, you would be basically computing something in, along the lines of this definition. So it's, so I look at times at which the trajectory intercepts the boundaries, which I had told you in the first slide, has detectors lined on it. And uh, since individual trajectories depend on the initial condition, uh, here we have at least in this abstract form, the first arrival time as a, for every individual trajectory as a function of the initial condition, which is R0. And of course, the geometry of the detection surface and so on. So I want to talk a bit about how powerful this thing is, I mean, before we get into uh, possible disagreements about whether this is a good definition or not, and I would point out some concerns that have been raised, but before we get into those, it's important that we step back and appreciate how much which has been achieved just because we could help ourselves to the trajectories which are available in this theory and not available in some other theories. So the first thing to notice is you couldn't have defined something like this in theories, uh, in, in the standard quantum theory, for instance, there is no such uh, quantity like this, or in uh, theories that some of uh, you guys are familiar with, the spontaneous collapse of many world theories. In fact, as you know, the, the collapse is supposed to be the, is supposed to herald the detection event. And we are talking about the time at which the detector clicks, or you could say, as a theorist when the wave function collapses. And everybody knows that, uh, at least in the standard theory, the time of occurrences of the collapse is not specified at all. So, so this is the first thing we can appreciate that given the resources of pilot wave theory and other trajectory containing quantum theories, we already have something to begin even exploring time of flight experiments. Okay. Uh, so far, this definition works for individual trajectories. 
But as you know, if once we repeat the experiments, the trajectories are going to change, uh, mainly because their initial conditions cannot be controlled uh, practically. So one naturally talks about the distribution of arrival times. And this distribution, are, so the randomness comes in through the changing initial condition. For every initial condition, you have a well-defined trajectory and hence a well-defined arrival time, according to this definition. But because you have an ensemble of trajectories across many runs of experiments, uh, you get different arrival time measure, I mean, different arrival time results in the experiment. And as soon as you make a statistical hypothesis about the changing initial conditions, which are just the initial position and the initial wave function, you immediately get by standard probability theory and statistics, a distribution of arrival times. Now, there are many things, uh, many uh, choices here. We could change the wave functions. We could keep the wave function fixed and talk about the changing particle positions. If, for our purposes, let's just look at the more simple thing in which the wave function is dependably prepared every time to be the same thing again and again. So it's the same psi zero, but the R zeros are now changing. And it's, it's uh, I mean, I don't want to uh, talk a lot about this, but for the purposes of uh, for the purposes of this talk, we could just take this as a postulate, although it's really not that the initial position are distributed according to the square of the wave of the initial wave function. So according to Bond's statistical rule, note that this is only a statistical hypothesis about the initial wave function. Uh, sorry, about the initial particle position. Uh, that's it. And after that, the theory takes over and and things evolve according to the equations I have presented. Okay, so this is well-defined. This integral is always well-defined, uh, very nice. And as I also said in the first slide, we have an associated non-detection probability. I mean, for, for instance, you know, in the double slit experiment, you could imagine many particles will not make it through the slit. Some of them will scatter off at the barrier and for them, which will not end up on the screen, the arrival time is undefined. So this is an abstract way of specifying what is the measure of those initial conditions for which you see no detection events. That is non-detection. So the non-detection probability appears naturally. Okay, so I, I will show some examples uh, so you don't have to worry if you didn't follow all the details in these definitions. Uh, and by the way, I should credit people who have suggested this over the years. I mean, uh, Levens is uh, Chris Levens is one of the names you would definitely come across when you talk about arrival time calculations using Bohmian trajectories. Uh, in the scattering papers of Der, Goldstein, Zangi, there's a lot of discussion of arrival position, arrival times. Uh, Grubel, Gabe Hart Grubel from Innsbruck and his students also have papers on it. And, and of course, today there are many, many papers which just because the numerical facilities have improved so much that it is now possible to just calculate these things and talk and discuss them in very interesting situations. I, I'll mention a few examples. Okay, so uh, almost uh, 50 minutes through and a lot of theory has been presented are there any questions at this point? Uh, any quick clarificatory questions or you know remarks that uh, I could take before proceeding further? Maybe you can go ahead, sit down, because we'll have plenty of time for discussion. Okay. So okay. So let's now get a little more concrete and try to you know see what these formulas give rise to. Uh, so uh, just one more slide before I do that. Uh, all this has been geometrically motivated and physical picture wise. One might wonder before even getting into a explicit computations, is this stuff on the right track? I mean, okay, the pictures look fine, but is, this, is there any indication that could you know, give us some reasons to think that this stuff is on track? And the answer is yes. Uh, in, in scattering situations, like which is, you know, very common uh, 
uh, problem in quantum mechanics, one can actually show because of the way the Bohmian trajectories behave, they actually become asymptotically Newtonian. You must have, you must have noticed that they become asymptotically straight lines. Because of such properties of the trajectories, one can prove that this expression, which is very complicated and we don't even know how to compute this object often because the trajectories are so complicated. But in scattering regime, one can show that this arrival time distribution exactly reduces to this, quant this quantity. It's a very important uh, uh, result. So, so we have actually an explicit expression for the arrival time distribution typically in scattering circumstances. Um, this is also called the quantum flux distribution. It can also appear in non-scattering circumstances, but this is where it naturally appears. And there are also a lot of theorems and mathematical physics work around this. So it's, it's quite tight. And so the good news is in this regime, at least, we are not obliged to compute individual trajectories, collect their arrival times, and then try to see what the statistics is. We can directly get the final arrival time distribution of the Bohmian trajectories in through this formula, which just involves an integral of the quantum probability current or the flux. That's a very important um, result because if you go into some good quantum mechanics textbooks like, uh, you know, Cohen Tanuji, for example, Ballantyne and of course the experts on scattering Mott and Massé, you will see that the scattering theory is completely based on the quantum flux, the probability current. Born rule is not used there because remember the, the scattering experiment is not about a position measurement at a given time for which Born's rule applies. But in scattering, particles are striking your detectors at different times, even if you prepare them all at a single time, let's say at a source. So so a different object appears in the discussion of scattering experiment, which is the quantum flux. So I might also say here that if you are not so much into the operator framework to begin with, actually the quantum flux would have been a natural guess for the arrival time distribution from scattering theory perspective. I think many uh, you know, older physicists who, who, who did this, on a daily basis would have suggested this as the answer rather than psi square. Of course, this couldn't be the correct answer in so, I mean, if you take just this expression and propose it to be an arrival time distribution, it couldn't be the correct answer in all situations because by itself, this formula actually can become negative. So there are wave functions for which this integral for certain surfaces, you know, if you cleverly play with this surfaces, this dou g, you can just make this integral negative. I will give you an example. But in scattering situations, and especially when the, the Bohmian one reduces to this explicitly, it is positive because it is exactly equal to another positive quantity here. Um, in any case, uh, also this defining the arrival in terms of trajectories is also very important for getting momentum statistics out from Bohm's theory. I mentioned briefly that it can reproduce the results of quantum mechanics, like in particular, the distribution of momenta of a particle prepared in a wave function. The books, of course, don't tell us how that is actually done in the experiment. I mean, we, of course, know what to calculate. We just Fourier transform and square that. But if you look into actual experiments, what is done in order to retrieve that object, it involves time of flight experiments, as I said. And if you were to analyze these experiments in Bohmian terms, you would again have to rely on defining the time of flight in terms of the trajectories. And then you reproduce exactly the Fourier transform squared, what quantum mechanics tells us. But of course, by going through all the steps of the experiment meaningfully. If you're interested in that stuff, I recommend this recent preprint where I discuss momentum measurements in quite some detail. Uh, actually, again, this is nothing original. I learned all this from Detlef in the early years I started working with him. Okay, so this slide again just gives you some reasons to think that all these, you know, abstract quantities might be up to something. Let's work out a quick example. Um, let's just take the same one dimensional particle prepared in a Gaussian wave packet and a detector placed at a certain distance L downstream. So initially, 
the particle is prepared in this state, it has a width sigma, and the Baumian particle is at some x0. So it could start either here or here or wherever, and that's x0. And this x0 is changing from one run of the experiment to the other, even though you take efforts to keep the initial wave function fixed, right? Okay, so the time evolved wave function, which is the solution of Schrodinger equation, also part of the pilot wave theory, I had already presented, so I'm rewriting it here. Now I'm just adopting these units where masses, lengths, and times are represented in a way so that things look a bit clean. It's just an illustrative example. So what do we do next? Of course, having found the wave function, we need the trajectories because our whole job you know, is around the arrival times of particles defined in terms of their trajectories. So if you plug in this wave function into the guiding equation, you get a rather, you know, rarely a nice equation that can even be solved. And for the Gaussian wave packet, these trajectories are well known. So, so if the x0 is 0, in that special case, the particle does not move, it's clear. If x0 is positive, the particle is moving to the right. And with time, and if x0 is negative, it's moving to the left. So it's quite clear those particles whose initial positions are realized to be negative, they're never going to make it to L. So I'm assuming L is positive. So they will never strike L in any finite time. And all of them are going to contribute to a non-detection probability. Of course, those with x0 positive uh, will contribute to a finite arrival time. And in this case, you can just explicitly tell at what time this trajectory is going to strike L. I've written down this formula. It's actually uh, quite involved. And we, uh, luckily, in this case, we can work out all the steps of all these quantities I introduced and come up with explicit expressions, uh, which is quite nice. So this is to say that, you know, all these things I was talking about normalization issues and negative probabilities and whatnot, it's nowhere in the picture. And, and the range of experimental settings for which uh, this definition is applicable is insanely rich. I mean, you name it, magnetic fields, multiple detectors, multi-particles, I mean, what have you. And that kind of flexibility is coming because the theory takes care of it, right? It's, it's trying to give you a motion which is aware of all this. And all you need to do is just compute the evolution, right, by solving these equations. That is to say, every time you're confronted with a challenging or new experimental situation, you don't have to think from scratch, you don't have to invent new mathematics and so on. Okay. Okay, there's a non-detection probability. About half of the particles really don't make it. Those are all the guys who started on the negative part of the x-axis and moved uh, to the left with time. Okay, so this is the last part of my talk just a couple of slides. I want to just put it here for people to think about. It's a very interesting application of these uh, definitions that I have introduced, again. But this time, involving a particle in three dimensions, and moreover, a particle with spin, like an electron. So for all of this talk, we will talk about electrons. Although I will, if I have time, I will say, for what other situations it generalizes. So this is actually the paper that brought Detlef and me really close, and we worked together with our colleagues at LMU. I guess Marcus Nert is among is here, who, who was our one major collaborator on this project. I'll mention the paper we wrote together, and then the research I start off also here. So thanks for showing up. Okay, let me talk about this experiment. It's again uh, in the style of the first slide. You have a particle which is prepared in a definite state, and then it is allowed to propagate, and we're interested in arrival or flight times at a specified detector. At this time, of course, it's not a free particle. We want the particle to move, be moving within a waveguide. So, so it, its wave function, or also in Baumian terms, the particle is just allowed to move within a constricted region. For simplicity, we can think of a cylindrical waveguide, which is made of you know, ele electromagnetic fields. So 
The experimental protocol is as follows. Initially, the particle is trapped, you know, in a certain compartment of the waveguide. So a small box, which is created at one end. And this particle, the electron now, I'm going to call it electron for the rest of the talk, will be prepared in certain um, states that I will specify. But uh, the states that I'm really interested in are the ground states, for example, of this box. So we know particle in a box has ground states, uh, even a particle with spin. And you can imagine preparing this electron in one of those ground states. So for a particle with spin, the ground state is degenerate. So there is not a unique ground state. So we will see what happens if we prepare different ground states. But one of these states is prepared. And once that is done, uh, this uh, shutter or the wall of the barrier is suddenly removed or the potential is turned off basically. And then the whole story now unfolds. The wave will now spread into the waveguide uh, and Bohm and de Broglie would tell us the particle is being carried along. And then there's a detector at a certain distance away. And we expect to see a click at some later time, okay? Um, but to analyze this experiment in Bohmian terms and to use those formulas which I've introduced, I have to say a little bit about how particles with spin are dealt with in, in the pilot wave theory. Uh, it's really not a very unnatural generalization. All that happens is the wave function is again in the story, but now the wave function is has more than one component. It's a spinor. For this talk, I'm just going to have non-relativistic physics in mind, but maybe we'll make comments about relativistic effects if there is interest. Uh, in any case, for, for non-relativistic discussion, I assume that the particle is well described by these equations. The wave function has two components, two spinor. It satisfies Pauli's equation. Uh, again, you know, if some of you uh, haven't seen them before, really the details won't bother us because I'm not really going to analyze these equations. I'm just telling you what, what the results that I'm going to share shortly are based on. And they're based on this wave equation, which is well known. And the guiding equation for particles with spin uh, looks similar to the spin zero guiding equation uh, a couple of slides before, but it has this additional peculiar term uh, which uh, uh, it's called the spin term generally, but Detlef also used to call it the Gordon term because it, uh, in some ways of getting it, it owes its origin to the Gordon decomposition of the Dirac current. In any case, this term is just a natural generalization of what happens, what you had for the spin zero particle, but that's not the full law. You have this additional piece and the whole thing will now be used to study arrival times. Uh, since I don't have too much time, I will not make a lot of comments about this law and what kind of new physics comes up, let's say for the double slit experiment or the tunneling experiments. But uh, if, there, if there is a question afterwards, I can make some comments or cite some sources. Okay, so these ground states that I'm interested in, in which the particle is prepared, are actually very special wave functions for which both the components of the spinner end up becoming, pro have the same spatial dependence. So they're kind of the same function, if you like. So you can pull it out and the whole wave function has this form and chi plus and minus are just complex numbers. So it's just the regular space spin separated spinner, which you, for instance, send into a stern gerlach apparatus in a spin measurement. Now, for, uh, and as long as you don't have magnetic fields in, in this situation, all these A's and everything become zero. And this equation more or less boils down to Schrodinger equation for this function. And the chi plus and minus don't mix, they don't change. So the two components of the wave function remain decoupled. And the time evolution is just given essentially in terms of Schrodinger's equation. And the guiding equation also simplifies considerably instead of having this, uh, you know, rather you know, it takes quite a bit of effort to even evaluate this for a generic wave function, but for space spin separated wave functions, you can see that uh, it kind of uh, looks like this. And all the information about this uh, spin part is coming in through a single vector, which I'm calling S hat, because you can show that it's actually a unit vector, 
which is obtained by contracting this spinner with the Pauli matrices. So sigma, if those who don't did not notice, is a vector which is made by whose components are Pauli spin matrices. So two cross two matrices. Um, and if you just contract this chi plus minus spinner with this matrices, you get a real valued vector because these are Hermitian matrices. And I'll say a bit more about this vector shortly. In any case, that, that matters for the dynamics. Uh, and it, it appears here in the guiding equation. Okay. Uh, before I present the results, it would be nice to just make a few remarks about the geometry of the setup. First of all, for a cylindrical waveguide, the axis of the waveguide is a special direction. And I was just telling you that the wave function itself manages to define a direction for us through this S vector. So whatever state you prepare, so whatever chi plus and minus we prepare, automatically gives us a privileged direction for this problem. Uh, and the results I'm going to show you really is an interplay of this direction, the spin, the, let me just call it the direction of the spin vector. And it's an, it's an interplay between the direction of the spin vector and the waveguide axis. Um, so it would be nice to write this chi plus minus in a more meaningful form. And as we do in quantum mechanics, I'll just adopt this particular block sphere parameterization. Actually, this parameterization, when you vary all the angles, covers all the ground states. So for different choices of alpha, beta, you get, you know, this spin up, spin down states and so on. So for instance, when alpha is zero, you get one and zero here. In that case, the spin vector is aligned parallel to the waveguide axis. When alpha is pi, you get spin vector aligned anti-parallel. And one interesting case is when alpha is pi half. In that case, the spin vector uh, associated with the wave function is perpendicular to the waveguide axis. So these cases are of interest. Of course, all of them are of interest, as we will see. Uh, let me not uh, get into a lot of details about how to solve the Pauli equation. I mean, now, now because of the space spin separation, just the Schrodinger equation. But just to give an idea, once you prepare these ground states and open the box, what actually happens is because the ground states are the most simple wave functions, are the most simple modes you could excite in a in any given geometry. Uh, in this problem, the transverse dependence, like so, the z direction is the is defining the axis of the waveguide and xy is any two orthogonal directions you can take. So the wave function kind of depends radial, uh, like symmetrically. It has cylindrical symmetry, axial symmetry, and all the interesting spreading and movement, at least on the level of the wave function, is coming through its dependence on the z coordinate. So here is here are a few snapshots of this quantity I'm calling phi parallel. So at time zero, you can see that it was well localized on the left. So it was built on, so it was supported on this compartment. Then we turned off the barrier and the wave suddenly gushes into the waveguide. And all that is coming through this phi parallel. And you can see as time progresses, the wave is slowly, you know, filling the entire waveguide and its support is spreading. And its amplitude is also diminishing because of unitary evolution. So, as far as the wave function is concerned, this is an exact solution. And all that is changing is this guy. And these are essentially fixed. So these are all fixed by whatever you prepared. OK. OK, now to the Baumian trajectories. So if you take this sort of wave function and plug it into this simplified guiding equation, and you can use, for example, Mathematica to compute these trajectories, and you immediately see some interesting dynamics, uh, which is, I guess, for some of you, these might be the first examples of spin-aware Baumian trajectories. So the alpha equals zero case in which the spin vector is parallel to the waveguide gives you these nice spiral trajectories. So if this was the detection plane, the particle would strike at a certain time and you would see a click. I mean, that would be the physical picture. Now, if you start changing alpha. So if you take another wave function whose alpha is different from zero, in particular, if it's pi half, then you get this very interesting uh, sort of dynamics in which the, you know, this is retrograde 
motion, a bit like the cycloids from a charged particle in closed, crossed electromagnetic fields. Actually, not quite. I mean, this, the rate at which they pro uh, proceed in different directions is not same as what we have in the cycloid motion, but the pictures are just similar. So the spin vector in this case, so I, I'm actually representing one. So I, there are two trajectories here, and one is for one kind of wave function, and another is for another. And for both of them, only this beta parameter has been different. I think they were 30 degrees and 60 degrees or something like that, or I might be stating it incorrectly. But what's interesting is this, I mean, the, the key takeaway from this slide is this nice unintuitive retrograde motion. Okay, so for different initial conditions, you can generate the Bohmian trajectories. And unfortunately, in this case, because the dynamics has become so complicated, I mean, we really cannot hope to even analytically solve for the trajectories, except actually in this spin parallel alpha equal to zero case, that there is really no hope to even, you know, use this formula that I use. So this formula from before. So the only option here is to do some good numerics. And thankfully today, it's, you know, in a couple of hours, you can sample many trajectories and just collect the arrival times, impact positions, plot them. You know, it's all not that difficult, thankfully. And, and because of that numerical resource which has been made available, this kind of research is really now popular and is being done by a lot of physicists, um, you know, thanks to all that. Okay, so let me directly show you what kind of distributions come up if if you subject this experiment to numerical analysis. Uh, I'll, I'll spend a few minutes on this slide, but before that, let me just introduce this quick notation. Uh, since every wave function depends on alpha, beta, you see, as I said, the wave function has a common spatial part, so that's same for all. What has changed from one ground state to another is the prepared alpha, beta. And that's why it's uh, it's fine to just de denote them through the superscripts. And we expect different alpha betas. So when you prepare particles with different wave functions and repeat the experiments every time with the same wave function, you get different statistics. Uh, actually, there's a lot to say about this picture and I may not be able to do justice to this in the limited time that I have. But what is the most important and striking thing that that is clear before us is in one case for one kind of wave function let's focus on this blue histogram here you have something that you expect of an arrival time distribution like some in some instances the particle arrived slowly in some instances it arrived fast so there is a nice tail here and and you know this distribution is reminiscent of the exact thing we had calculated for the one dimensional gaussian few slides ago. Here, of course, we had an analytical expression. Uh, in the spin case, we don't have. But, you know, it's kind of, at least, it seems reasonable. Uh, and what's very striking and very unexpected is once you prepare the particle in the spin perpendicular states, so alpha equals pi half, and regardless of beta, the particle ends up so the arrival times, the first arrival times, I have to be careful because I was showing you this retrograde motion. So in principle, these trajectories would cross multiple times. But if you say the experiment stops as soon as the particle strikes, the hitting time, the first arrival time, if that quantity you collect numerically and just render the histogram, this would appear you know, if, by sampling just about 10 to the power 4 trajectories or something. I mean, you can even see the smaller lobes and so on. Now, the smaller lobes are actually coming up because as soon as we open the shutter, sort of like shockwave-like features developed in the wave function, that's coming from the Schrodinger equation. But it leaves its imprint on the particle's arrival time because the wave function is guiding the particle up to the detector. Uh, so there, there are interesting gaps and and... So, I mean, these depend a lot on the shape of the potentials also. So in any case, we see this multimodal distribution with gaps. And the most striking thing 
which we have to talk about now is the fact that this red distribution just drops to zero after a point. Now, numerically, one cannot make such a claim that it strictly goes to zero. But uh, thanks to Marcus, our colleague, in a follow-up paper, we actually proved that by analyzing the Bohmian dynamics, and it's a very, very nice paper if you're interested in dynamical systems work and nonlinear dynamics, can actually prove that indeed every individual Bohmian trajectory of the spin perpendicular wave function strikes your screen, which is a flat surface in this case, by a certain maximum arrival time, which we call tau max. So if you were to do an experiment, if nothing was wrong and this picture and the story here was correct, then one would expect to see no clicks after this tau max in the case of the particle prepared in the spin perpendicular case. And this, this is something extremely beguiling and I'm sure many of you find it very striking as we did. We spent many days and weeks thinking about it and trying to study it on different levels. And I'm happy to tell you that that effect really survives all sorts of uh, changes. You can play with the waveguide, you can make it, you know, take your favorite shape, change the potentials. You can even do a relativistic treatment of the problem, which I did not discuss based on the Dirac equation. I mean, you can even make the particle having spin different from half. And there's various generalizations you could imagine of this experiment in every such case, including even when you take a composite particle like an hydrogen atom prepared, let's say in a triplet state, so these are all one body problems we are discussing, but you can imagine doing the same experiment with a hydrogen atom with an appropriate waveguide. And the analysis there becomes very hard because now it's a two body problem and the wave function is a four component object. If you do all that, this phenomena is just there. It is so robust that you know we actually can give you good scaling laws for how this behaves when you change the diameter of the waveguide, when you change the separation between the source and the screen. You know, the, the things that we do as physicists, you know, we want to study all quantities that affect here. And the good news, at least from an experimental perspective is, no matter, regardless of where your detector is, like regardless of its distance, whether it's in the far field, near field, this relative shape of um, these two distributions remain. And they're not destroyed by anything that I mentioned. So that's why Detlef and I expressed, uh, you know, strong conviction in the paper that, you know, we should expect to see a certain spin dependence in an actual experiment. And I think I, I definitely stand by it even today. And uh, I can give additional reasons if we, we discuss this further. Uh, this is also a very interesting result. Uh, so you can prepare different wave functions and in certain cases, the statistics will be identical. And this has to do with the symmetries of the, you know, like uh, since there is no preferred X axis in the setup, it's a circularly symmetric setup. You don't, and this beta is the angle of the spin vector with respect to the X axis, which is arbitrary. You don't expect the arrival time distribution to depend on this beta. So for regardless of what beta you prepare, the distributions would be the, same as each other. This symmetry is also very interesting and that has to do with the waveguide axis being a preferred direction in this problem. So alpha equal to Z, alpha is measured with respect to the waveguide axis, which is not an arbitrary direction. It's a preferred direction in this setup. Okay, and you could also use excited states instead of ground states and then more interesting things happen. So since I've taken a, over an hour now, hour and a half almost, uh, so th this is more or less what I had to convey. I have a few, uh, so this will come up in discussion section, uh, you know, concerns about whether the physics of the detection process or the way the experiment is implemented, will it decisively affect our, uh, our what we have calculated here in this naive way, you know. Uh, I, I'm sure we'll be talking about it a lot. So let me directly conclude here. Uh, I mean, and the conclusion is more broad and it has, it's not just about this particular experiment I discussed. Basically, 
some comments are really necessary. So as, as I try to tell you that research on arrival time measurements has not you know, been very popular in the physics community. And that's really unfortunate because you know, in foundations now we widely acknowledge the measurement problem, Bell tests are done with great interest and the Nobel Prize acknowledged all the efforts. But the arrival time problem, which is also grounded in experiment, is, is not receiving so much attention. And uh, you know, this itself can be the subject of a whole talk. Uh, and even if you were not persuaded by the particular Bohmian style calculations I was showing you, at least you should be bothered that there are so many proposals for a single kind of very clearly laid out experiment and, and physicists are unable to agree with each other, like what we will see if we do these experiments. And the number of proposals is not one or two or three, and then experiment can decide if there are so many which kind of suggests an inherent ambiguity in the theory we, we so much love and use, that's quantum mechanics. Um, and this is also just a sociological thing I come across. I mean, the, the way this talk might have convinced you, this is just conventional physics. This is scattering experiments, which is you know the main stay of quantum mechanics. We are really not talking about new phenomena here or new physics like collapse, wave function collapse, a dark matter, and so on. So the signatures we are getting here are really not even small signatures, and the effort needed to understand them is, you know, you know, you, you have to put in a lot of work, as some of you know well, to really uh, filter out the signatures of interest in these situations. So here, if you do these experiments, and, and I, I really hope that we'll, we'll see more of these in the next years, you will see the whole distribution. And it's not a single number or parameter that you have to bother about. You have to fit the whole thing, right? Um, so I think it's a wonderful opportune moment given all the progress in this femtosecond, attosecond experiments. And the laser technology is very important for building these waveguides. I didn't have time to talk a lot about it. Of course, in this case, as you can see, the theory is ahead of experiments. Theorists have produced a lot of literature. So the experiments that will be most informative have to be guided by theory. I just presented one experiment which I worked on for many years. And it's, of course, very close to me and Detlef also. So I just suggested one, but there could be other experiments. Uh, I'll perhaps mention a few. And... Uh, and you know, if there are young graduate students looking for thesis topics, and this is exactly what you should be working on. And anyway, so with that, okay, I don't think, okay, I don't have a slide mentioning alternative experiments, uh, but so if you go to Google Scholar, the latest article I write, I do talk about some alternative experiments that could be done because actually the spin one that I presented still has to wait for some experimental techniques to come in place. But in the meantime, we can do other experiments and uh, other arrival time experiments. And let's hope this discussion becomes more streamlined and more quantitative. And, you know, and as I said, by 2026, which is 100 years of Schrodinger equation, hopefully we have some clear answers which can be written down in textbooks. <coughs> Just, aside, just beside the bond rule. Okay, so thank you for your time. Great. Thank you so much, Siddhant, for this extraordinary and beautiful lecture, which was very, very clear. Yeah, yeah. Pleasure. Thank and uh, the talk is open for questions, please. You can use the raise hand icon if you would like to ask a question. <clears throat> so maybe while this, uh, the, some hands come up, Siddhant, I have a few things to discuss with you. Uh, yeah. what this, is a, this is a bit naive picture. What we want is something like a slow motion replay of the process in, with which the quantum particle hits the apparatus. Uh, it's not an instantaneous process. It's a scattering. Um, uh, so... Um, like the pointer is there, the quantum particle comes in, uh, it forms a 
what you call a product state, say, and yeah. the pointer is driven from the ready state to uh, the so final, other... final. In the collapse model, that would be a breakdown of superposition. In your Bohmian picture, that's a deterministic process. Yes. What kind of experiment, or is it not feasible, what kind of experiment would do a slow motion replay of what happens from the start to the end when a quantum system meets a measuring apparatus? So, so I see that, so you are asking, so, so it's not a theory question. So the question is probably about actual experiment. Am I right? Yes. We so you're asking what experiment. experiment counts as what you were describing heuristically. Yes, yes, so, yes. Yeah, I mean, my answer would be it's it's exactly the other way around. Because in the first slide, I introduced in experimental terms, as experimental colleagues would present, how this experiment is carried out. And I also suggested along the way that they give pages and pages of detail about what they actually do. And the question that I'm interested in is what theory accounts for that? If that theory involves modeling of a macroscopic pointer through quantum theory bottom up, sure, then we have to do it. If something else could be done, then that needs to be done. So, so my answer is, it's the experiment that comes first for me. So I'm actually looking at actual experiments, what they do. And, and I'm hoping that one of these approaches should be able to come close to the data, given that they already work in similar experiments. Like, you know, when we discuss the double slit experiment, for example, you use a screen to measure the impact position, which uses similar resources as arrival time experiments perhaps not the most ideal arrival time experiment, but there is actually data reported in the literature where people measured for individual helium atoms, the arrival position and the arrival time with the same detector. Now, I don't think many of us would ask these kind of questions when we describe the arrival position, but at least my talk might have made it clear that those are also equally suspect because they are tagged by individual arrival times. So at least as far as I am concerned, I mean, I, so what you are asking is also of interest. You know, Aronov and company came from that angle, I believe. They tried to model these devices in a rather oversimplified form, which led to some of their negative conclusions, in my opinion, which I quoted in the beginning. But I am trying to push myself and colleagues to answer the other question that experiments are more clear than the theory in this case. Okay, uh, well, thanks a lot. I, I will come back to that, but I think some hands are up. Burnt, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you. There, are, um, one brief comment. So people already noticed in 1925 or until 1930 that there was a problem with uh, with um, time measurements in quantum theory. Um, they even tried non Hermitian apparatus uh, in 1927. But they had trouble with finding a correct probability distribution or probabilistic interpretation of non-Hermitian apparatus. So this was done in, in, in the early 19 in the in the late 1920s by, for example, you, Paul you Dirac of names in mind. Dirac, Paul Dirac published a paper in 1926 where he uh, tried to introduce a time operator. Well. Pascal Jordan uh, did the same, so he was uh, actually inspired by Dirac's paper. Uh, and there's a paper authored by Born and Wiener from uh, 1926, where they also tried to introduce the time operator. And Jordan explicitly tried to use a non Hermitian time operator already in 1927. And he also tried to make uh, find a way how to, well, express probabilities if you have uh, complex, uh, well, if you have complex operators. So he calls them complex because they're uh, non Hermitian, because there's an, an analogy between Hermitian operators and uh, real numbers and complex numbers and non Hermitian operators. It did, 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 did not work out. Uh, it had so to wait until. Did not work out. By that, you mean they could not find the uncertainty relations? They were mainly interested. They could not find a way how to calculate probabilities. Okay. So they could not uh, gen generalize the Born rule to a setting where you work with non-Hermitian operators. That was the problem. So they got complex or negative numbers for probabilities, which doesn't make any sense. So they could not find a function which could act as a probability function. So with a range between a one and a zero. Yeah. At least uh, uh, this is what I uh, 
took from the papers, uh, or at least they could not find a probability distribution which gives rise to localized states. This was the main trouble. So if you use non oh, okay, operators, yeah. uh, then you get a kind of, yeah, you don't get uh, a clear so you mean localization. So the arrival time operators somehow not localized at the site of detection. Yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah, the this, trouble. This happens so. even with the Arno Bohm guy, I think. Ah, okay. Um, so, so much for this. And the other thing um, is, uh, is a question. You said there's an obstruction to quantization by uh, develop found by Greenwald, so the Dutch yes, researchers. That was, Could you... that was probably that's in one of my slides. Yes, exactly. And I would uh, understand oh, no, it better. I, think I just removed the slide and just mentioned it as a bracket somewhere because I thought I wouldn't have time to. I'm sorry. It was in the beginning, isn't it? It was in the beginning. I just tried to, uh, try to understand this better. What's, what, what's the problem? Uh, ah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. This I can elaborate on if you like. Uh, I mean, so first let me quote the theorem and let me try to do it correctly. So, so as you know, the... Uh, Back then, the, the idea was to promote the classical phase space functions into appropriate Hilbert space objects. Yeah, Dirac's idea to map a uh, Poisson brackets to commutators. Exactly. So this theorem says if you want three things which Dirac wanted, one is what you said, the Poisson bracket should go to appropriate commutators. The other is they wanted the XP to go to their particular commutator, like they have to be commuting canonically. What was the third one? This, there are three conditions, and my my guess is it's uh, I, I could look it up by the time somebody else asks. But I have actually also covered it in the, the memorial article. So there are like three conditions. I mean, these okay, are the, we can so, wait. Yeah, I can look third, this up. The third condition is all phase space function should have a map. So anything, ah, okay. any uh, real valued function of x and b. Let, let's just take one particle in one d. Then the theorem already works, and you can see the force of the theorem. So you so the three conditions are you want all Poisson brackets to go to commutators, all uh, her, uh, all phase space functions or what are called classical observables should have corresponding quantum images as Hilbert space operators, self-adjoint, and X and P should go behave in the usual way. So for example, in the position representation, it will be multiplication operator and the derivative. And Gronewald more or less showed that these three are mutually inconsistent. So there is no quantization map which fulfills all of them. And that's okay. a showstopper. And, and of course, the next question is, if you can relax some of these, why all phase space functions can be restricted to something reasonable? And more or less, the way he, it was a constructive proof, and he shows that you can only work with polynomials, which are at most quadratic in X and P, which is not the kind of operators we want to quantize in this situation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would have additional yeah. questions, but I give, uh, well, I stop now so that no, Anthony right. can uh, ask his uh, question. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much for the uh, talk. Um, thank you. I, I worked on this myself uh, some years ago. Uh, this was back in the 1990s with colleagues, and we were using a fully relativistic uh, approach based on the Dirac equation. Mm -hmm. um, I put a, an example paper from that in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, I'm going to save it. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. And so what I wanted to raise is that it seems to me there, there are two things important here. One is using the Dirac equation, you've got a very nice probability current yes. uh, sitting there, which is always positive definite, which is you know a very nice advantage. What do you mean by it's positive definite? I mean, you mean like it always points forward in the light yes. cone. Yes, yes. So it's future pointing, but it's not positive definite in the sense of on a screen or something, right? That's um, not what you meant. The time component is always positive. positive. Okay, so it has a positive density, unlike the yeah. Klein-Gordon current. Yes, yes. Okay. So that's point one. Point two is in, in our approach, we weren't thinking of it at all as Bohmian. <laughs> Yes, uh, because the Bohmian, uh, you know, way of doing things, you've got a whole superstructure there of these quantum potentials and quantum torques of their spin, 
quantum forces, all of that, it seemed to us, was entirely unnecessary. And all you needed to do was to follow streamlines of the Dirac equation. There's nothing else. That's exactly what these needed. predictions are based on, by the way. What I, I understand, but, but the explanation you gave and others gave over many years, I mean, we were doing this after seeing the work of Liebens in, you know, in the 1990s, who oh. was using a Bohmian approach. Um, everyone else was saying, oh, you have to think of it in this Bohmian fashion with all these extra uh, ingredients. And they were put forward as extra ingredients. Whereas you don't need any of that. You've got a very simple approach possible underneath, which uh, you can use in all these circumstances where you just use the direct current and you follow streamlines of, of that. So wh why do you think, why do you call this necessarily Bohmian when maybe I'm just associating the wrong things with it? And I think in terms of all these extra bits, but they are unnecessary. Well, I mean, I think the short answer is because what are called Bohmian trajectories are just the streamlines of the flux, what you perhaps worked with. I guess it's just a matter of, uh, I mean, per, per, I mean, they are, also, you could, might as well just call them flux lines if, if that's helpful. Fine, but do you need the word Bohmian for that? Because he introduced all this extra superstructure. Well, actually, the, the the flux lines of the Dirac current defining motion come, is even earlier than that. I mean, I know Bohm in 1953 wrote a paper explicitly stating it in response to critics, but de Broglie has been proposing the, the same guiding equation. I wouldn't know the date by heart. I mean, the whole idea, I mean, I actually don't know what, so, so basically you're not happy with the idea of physical corpuscles moving along these flux lines, you think that's an additional baggage? Well, you I'm see, sure. if you only take the flux lines, they're infinitely long curves. They have no start and finish. But in an arrival time experiment, you have a well-defined region in which things start, and then they propagate until detectors at a distance click. And that's, you know, in terms of trajectories, it's motion. You could they got them just particles moving around on the flux line. So it's like a race course, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you seed the streamlines. So, and so then you I would follow. say that streamlines alone, I don't see how they can help. Because if you start at different points on the streamline, you're going to get different arrival times for a given detection. Oh, that's what I'm saying. So it's how you seed that, and that's the initial distribution. You don't need anything else. Oh, okay. But but wouldn't you get exactly what I'm showing here? Because what what sorry I'm again going in the wrong direction. So these fancy uh, distributions that I was showing you are produced by saying that you know these are the hitting times of flux lines, if you like, for the Dirac current. You get exactly the same picture if you repeated the calculation with the force spinner evolving according to the Dirac equation. Yeah, I'm commenting on how it's wrapped up in the Bohmian apparatus, and it doesn't need to be at all, that's all. Yeah, so I think, I, Anthony, if I understand you, what you're saying is that if it is true that the experimental predictions of Bohmian mechanics are the same as that of quantum mechanics, these are two different languages, and then maybe there's a preference for whether we need this wrapping up or not. That's what you are saying, no? These are two different equivalent languages, no? Certainly what you get from the streamline approach should match precisely the quantum mechanical uh, predictions. But though I fully agree that the quantum mechanical predictions can't come up with by themselves the arrival times, you need the streamline picture to be able to do it. I'm just distinguishing between the streamline picture, which has no extra bits needed, and what Bohmian mechanics is normally thought about uh, in terms of, as I say, quantum forces, quantum torques, all sorts of extra things going on, which you, in fact, don't need. Yeah, uh, I had a related point to make, which I could put it as, although we say that Bohmian mechanics is deterministic, God does play dice with the initial conditions. Yes. And that's always bothered me. of the universe, right? Sorry? Not of the universe, because that's the... Uh... Well, is that what we are going to put it back to? So where does the uh, uh, probability distribution 
of the initial conditions in Bohmian mechanics come from? Is it because you think I'm coarse graining an underlying deterministic theory which I don't yet know? Or is it, uh, yeah, this is the part that bothers me, that you have, you have, probabilities in Bohmian mechanics in the initial conditions. I mean, so, I, I thought that's exactly what you do in any deterministic theory if you have to do statistics, right? I mean, in Newtonian mechanics, no, so my you question, had a box of yeah, ideal yeah. gas and you just opened it in a tube, like this experiment. My question is deeper. Why, do, why is quantum mechanics statistical? So we, we would like to get there, no? Like, in the collapse language, of course, we ask why does the wave function collapse and collapse models. But that make... also one puts in, isn't it? I agree. I agree. So I'm saying that uh, would you agree that Bohmian mechanics is not the final word in our trying to understand uh, dynamics? I, because oh, yeah. I, I mean, the I answer to that is just a clear yes, right? I mean, uh, there is so many dynamical questions I wouldn't be able to formulate. No, I'm not going to things like quantum gravity and all, but yes, even no, if no. I say quantum mechanics is incomplete, would it be fair to say that Bohmian mechanics is also incomplete? Because it does not tell me why there is a probability distribution in the initial conditions. I mean... Yep. Can I come in at that point briefly? Bohm himself would certainly have said exactly that. Indeed, he did say it in Causality and Chance in Modern Physics. Repeat that, Michael. What uh, did he... Bohm himself was, was quite clear that his theory was incomplete in the sense that you're now describing. Uh, he goes out of his way in Causality and Chance in Modern Physics to make that point. That, that's all I'm saying. That, I, mean, I have no, no other contention. It's all very beautiful what has been done and... Of course, Anthony is saying that these two are equivalent, but nonetheless, it's beautiful, all right, the way the uh, thing is so clear. So, they but are, I want they're, they're equivalent modulo 20 arrival time predictions. I'll say how Anthony won't be able to have these predictions, is it? No, but other people have, right? Oh, but oh no, I totally agree. Your method is far cleaner. No, no, it's not even my method, first of all. No, but no, you, saying... your, your meaning, your meaning, the Bohmian method, uh, even if quantum mechanics and Bohmian mechanics as the, are equivalent, this is one problem where the Bohmian, Bohmian formalism is much, much clearer. And I understood Anthony is saying that he can achieve this level of clarity with Dirac streamlines. I don't know more about it. I, I mean, I just what. I heard from Anthony, but it's, I mean, nothing takes away the beauty of what you have described. There's a, Marcus uh, had his Yeah, hand. Marcus wanted to say something. I wanted to I'm bring Sorry for making you wait. Uh, no problem. I was just commenting on the comment that maybe, I mean, it's, it's basically just a sociological question of what Bohmians like call their theory. And I personally have never met a Bohmian who takes these forces really seriously. Because somehow the, I mean, they originated because you take the, the flux of quantum mechanics and you take another derivative to arrive at a second order formulation to make it very close to what Newtonian mechanics look like, looks like. And this has in like a big part of the community fallen into disfavor. And nowadays people just have the flux, flux lines and call that Bohmian mechanics. Um, There's no I talk of, of, Forces anymore. I also did what not. What is that word? No talk of? Of, force, force, of quantum forces, forces, forces or forces, things like forces. that. I, I have to come in with an objection there, I'm afraid. Sorry. <laughs> Please. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Well, you say, I mean, this is a sociological observation. Uh, you say there is no talk of forces in the amongst the, well, the people you're identifying as the community. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you have very much in mind the, the people who do nail the you know the the, the label Bohmian mechanics to their mast you know Shelley Goldstein and his fellow workers um I mean Basil Kiley I can I mean you know, I don't want to speak for him but I was just talking to him literally for three hours this morning I, I certainly would not agree with what you've just said I mean his entire approach is based on 
uh, introduced in, in, on an analysis of these additional forces, um, of which, you know, of course, which he seeks to relate to this underlying notion of the quantum potential. But there are all sorts of intervening. Um, stages in which they're, um, you know, the, he, he, allege, he alleges that they're needed. So I just think as a general observation, um, it, it's not a reflection of the... And the problem is that people use the term Bohmian as if it was an all-purpose portmanteau label for what are, in fact, very different approaches. Um, I mean, Bohm himself, Bohm himself ra rather channeling Marx, you know, he, he used to say, um, you know, I, I only know that I myself am not a Bohmian. And uh, indeed, he was, he was very adamant that the, the very term Bohmian mechanics was one that he found uh, very uncongenial because, of course, his fundamental outlook was, was, not, uh, was not a mechanical outlook to begin, to, to begin with, which I guess goes to the point about how seriously you take all this talk of additional forces. I mean, it's, I it's certainly a cannot... theological remark. I'm not, I'm not seem, seeking to make a judgment, but, uh, but I just wouldn't, I, I, I don't think one should sweep the... Uh, uh, under the table, the fact that there are um, people out there who still do very much you know, cleave to this, what uh, Anthony Lazenby was calling additional baggage, um, but, but which I think could also be called you know, conceptually more uh, open-minded and adventurous ways of exploring what the possible limitations and defects of the existing quantum formalism might might be. I kind of cause not speak for the whole community. There's too no. many people. But uh, for example, with, with Sheldon Goldstein, I've never heard he talks about these forces. No, he what? doesn't. You know, he's he's very okay. much. You know, no, okay. he's 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 he knows. But 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 that's precisely why he and uh, Basil Hiley are constantly loggerheads whenever they whenever there are meetings of the uh, what okay. call, loosely called the Bohmian camp. Uh, it, was, it was a generally sociological observation. But uh, okay. I think we are getting too much into presentation battles of theory. Yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, again, it's the same thing. Somebody prefers. The, I mean, strictly they are not equivalent. If you present the guiding equations in slightly different form, and that needs a technical discussion. But what's clear from here is, you know, people just like to present the equation which gives you these trajectories in different forms. I mean, if that's going to give you insight. Yes and no, right? I mean, depends on the presentation and what you are after. These deeper questions you asked about, does it explain fundamental randomness? I mean, I don't have much to say about it in a short time. I mean, I'm aware of the way Detlef makes sense of the randomness uh, using Boltzmannian <coughs> statistical arguments. And I'm aware of other ideas in the literature. But that's uh, really not the focus of either this presentation or also, if you do, I mean, to be honest, if you do these experiments about which I'm after, you're not going to learn, uh, insofar as I can see, anything deep about those questions, about what's the origin. I agree. I, agree. No, I just said what you would absolutely say, clear I is you would repeat experiments, you get random outcomes. And if you have a deterministic theories, then you will ask, okay, what, what gives you these different results if, I, if everything is predetermined? And though the only way to answer that is by saying your initial conditions changed, of course. Assuming the laws didn't change every time we repeated the experiment, that's just old school, right? So I don't see much novelty in what's happening here from what has happened in classical statistical mechanics. And as always, either you assume a certain statistical distribution for the initial conditions, of course, you don't blindly assume it, you have arguments for it, and so on and so forth. And there are were all of that in the Bohmian literature as well. But that's, no, the, I was just that's going a beyond, topic again. I was just going beyond and suggesting that the uh, underlying true da fundamental dynamics is probably completely deterministic. And uh, there is some coarse graining going on because of which we encounter randomness as of now in the experiments which we are able to do. And if these experiments are more refined to a higher resolution in some parameter, in which, in my mind, could be time of arrival. Suppose that if the time of arrival was to be measured, perhaps as accurately as Planck time, we hmm. might see that the world is totally deterministic. In yeah, I can fully imagine that. And these theories make no commitment to what you're going to see there, because they are not even... I agree. I agree. of the physics I agree. on those scales. They are yeah. just 
Yes. So let's come back to what you actually talked about. So suppose I think again of a simple-minded situation, a classical mechanics, a collision problem, a marble comes and hits a bigger marble and there's a scattering. It's a very straightforward experiment. I can describe what happened. Let us take the analog of this as a quantum particle coming and hitting the pointer. I want to know which is the experiment which will tell me what path in time the pointer took while arriving at its final position. I mean, theory can surely answer for you, right? I mean, if you analyze the whole experiment, assuming in your theory you have structures for defining paths and all, then in the in the theory, there is an answer. If you're asking quantum me mechanics, how... Quantum mechanics cannot answer that, right? Well, it, because it doesn't talk about paths. And at least in its canonical formulation, there is no paths, no movement of actual matter in three-dimensional world in some explicit way, right? So maybe collapse theories, if you could analyze this huge uh, system, could tell you. But but your is your question, what experiment will tell yes, me? Yes. Let there be an experiment with which I see this thing played out in slow motion replay. And then I have various theories which come and predict what their prediction for the trajectory is. And then I, like collapse models, Bohmian mechanics, or whatever else. And then I can compare these theories with basically a slow motion replay of the collapse process to my mind is what is missing in experiments, probably because it's technologically extremely challenging. You mean theoretically? No, or experiment, experiment. Like uh, I want to watch the wave function collapse. If it collapses, I don't want to see it going from a superposition to one of the outcomes without knowing what happened in between. In between, there is a nice exponential decay of one state, exponential buildup of the other. Uh, and in principle, a technologically competent experiment will show me what is exactly is going on in between. Yeah, I haven't thought very deeply about that question. But surely the time scales involved here are extremely small compared to the time scales of these arrival time experiments. Yeah. So maybe they, some of this gets done, maybe it gives you some guidance into thinking yeah. about your It's question. like we are in a primitive state. Uh, you be, maybe some other analogy we could take in history. Uh, I don't know, like not having measured trajectories, shall sharply enough to realize uh, that they were actually to obey something which we some ex technology improved and then we realized that ah this is the reason why we need a new theory something like that so my, my feeling is that some technology is limiting us from actually seeing the slow motion replay and that is hindering development of theory Do you have some concrete? Uh... I say, yeah, collapse model. Like collapse models, if in this one, it's one some of its simpler versions, will tell me that when the quantum system comes and hits the pointer in a ready state, they form an entangled state, and it would give me a time profile of the entangled state, uh, which is where, of course, the time is very short. The collapse time scale tau. But it tells me what happens. And if I had an experiment which could resolve, let's say, a nanosecond and play it out for me on a scale of 10 to the minus 12 seconds resolution, say, I would actually see what's happening in the experiment and say, compare it with the collapse model. So that should be answered by Sandro, right? Is he? Still oh, Sandro's here? here. Sandro's here. Is he still here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, the, would I you like to, like to say something, Sandro? Uh, no, yeah, you're, you're correct uh, in saying that uh, in the process of a measurement, the collapse model can tell something interesting. I, I think it would not be a trivial calculation, but one can try to model it. Uh, however, the, the limit I see in collapse model in telling something on arrival time is that 
if you want to study what happened to your microscopic particle along the old trajectory, I mean, as long as the particle is far away from the detector, the dynamic of collapse model is essentially the one of Schrodinger equation because the amplification mechanism only kick in the collapse only when you're close to the detector. So if you don't have a good or an obvious prescription in quantum mechanics, I don't think collapse model can help for 90% of the of the time. Then when you get closer to the measurement device, you can get some more information, but I suppose that, that is only a small part of the, the whole time of light. So even if that you can describe a bit better, good, is nice, but what you do with all the previous part? The, yeah, this is what I thought when, because yeah, so I also... Question, Sandra, one other question, Sandra, was mm. what experiment should I do to watch the collapse happening? Ah. What do you mean by watch the collapse happening? It is not an instantaneous process. It starts at some time T1 when the particle arrives at um. the at that time itself has a distribution, but let's say it arrives at some time T1. The final state of the pointer, say to the left or right, is reached at a time T2. Yeah. What, what happens between T1 and T2 in the experiment? The pointer moves from the ready state to one of the final states. That process is a finite time process in which as a classical particle, mm -hmm. it has a trajectory. I want to measure its position as a function of time when it is going from the ready state to the mm -hmm. one of the final outcomes. Mm. Okay. Uh... I don't have an answer on this. I mean, one way to model this may be that you, you put some system of mesoscopic size, so where yeah. the collapse is, is strong but not too strong, because if it is too strong, everything happens instantaneously. If it is too small, you don't see anything. And I suppose if you use some simple model, like the QMUPL, you know, when everything is linear quadratic, you should be able to... I think maybe there is a paper of Angelo. In yeah, there is a paper. There's a theory calculation. Hmm. Bassi and somebody, I forget who it is. Yeah, that I think in 2005. And, 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 uh, and uh, maybe Dur, maybe Dur, and it's a very nice, it's a very clean hmm. paper. But now I want to do an experiment to test whether what they found is what we see. Well, I suppose you can do an experiment. Okay, I'm just inventing on the spot, so maybe <laughs> I'm completely wrong. But what if you take this mesoscopic system, which then you measure with some very large macroscopic standard device for which everything is bit practically instantaneous. But then on this mesoscopic system, you can, I don't know, try to perform position measurement at different times and see what are the statistics by doing the measurement time at time T1, T1 plus epsilon, T1 plus 2 epsilon, until T2. But I don't know. I, I need to think of it a bit yeah, more. Thank you. Thank you for responding. Yeah, yeah so uh, you well, uh, see, then this is the kind of thing I had in mind, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for... for thank you to you. Yeah, Tim, uh, Tim, go ahead, please. Um. Yeah, I'm not. I'm just trying to understand the question that's being asked, um, because of course the problem is there's there's very little you can actually observe. I mean, you're certainly not going to observe anything about the wave function collapsing because you never observe the wave function. Um, to to observe some process going on over time, you have to make a series of measurements, and we're already just trying to figure out can we make predictions about single measurements right like you know yes. what was when, when did the thing fire off or, or or whatever um as soon as you get in talking about making a series of measurements over on, on a single system over time then you get into xeno paradoxes then you have to worry about the reaction you know you're doing very intrusive things to the system 
you're certainly not going to get a picture of what happens when the when the device isn't there um, for well-known reasons, right? You'll get you'll get Zeno problems and everything else. You will have a very strong so interaction. Why it is, what you're why looking it for is, is something that's extremely passive, um, where where the 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 particle itself sets off something that can be the single thing that can be measured to to hope for a, a series of things that could also give you a you know, a picture of the collapse over femtosecond scale or whatever it is you're looking for. I, I just, I mean, it, it seems like this is asking for something far beyond the very simple, actually accessible data. That so it, it's a that's it limitation of play. technology. It's a limitation of technology in principle. But it's not just technology. It's also the theoretical situation, right? I mean, as soon as you're making a series of, say, position measurements, independently of the technology you're now interfering with the system in a very radical way right everybody understands that that's why you get xeno paradoxes right you do if, if you do classically i mean classically quantum mechanically a series of position measurements or you know rotation of 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 uh phase measurements or whatever very very rapidly then the prediction is you'll freeze out the motion yeah, we know that, right? And it's not because the motion freezes if you're not doing that. It's because your interference has the effect of freezing out the motion. If I constantly am projecting it out, right, in some direction. Yes. Um, so uh, again, the, the the point here is to try and look for experimental situations which are as passive as possible, mm. right? As as much the the particle just doing what it's you know setting everything off, and not me poking the particle over and over again to, to, to see what it's going to do. So, so what makes the situation different in Newtonian classical mechanics? Well, uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody has ever done a proper analysis. People often say things like, well, in Newtonian mechanics, in principle, you can measure anything without interfering with the system. That's, of course, not true. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in Newtonian mechanics, you'd make a measurement, there'll be back reaction. Um, yeah. Then they say, oh, but I can make it as small as I like. Well, what makes you think that? I mean, I, I mean I've mean, i never seen an analysis which even attempted to quantify any of this. Hmm. Um, and, and I don't think going through Newtonian mechanics is a particularly good idea here because this is a fundamentally non-Newtonian theory. And, you know, we ought to be looking at at, at the sorts of behaviors that, that seem to be controlled pretty directly by the wave function in, in at least, you know, this kind of setting the particle trajectories are. So you're just looking for things that the particle trajectories will leave marks on that are easily accessible and as 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 um, passive as possible. And these look like, you know, nice I, you know, nice ideas. I mean, you know, a, a single a, a single uh, photon being set off or or a mark on a screen or something like that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I see what you are saying. I'll, I'll think it over. I still have this, some kind of a dream that you can do a slow motion replay. But you are saying there are not just technology questions, but questions of principle. Uh, it would be interesting to yeah, see an it, idea it's, of how slow can the slow motion replay be before it is sure. rendered impossible. Right. I mean, and one might just say, look, measurements aren't magic. I mean, that's kind of the point. Measurements are themselves physical and must be physical operations. Absolutely. So yeah. you have to take account of the physics of that operation if you want to understand the outcome. Right? Yes, that, that's all I'm the saying. To try and render, render the, the, the device as unintrusive as yes. possible so yes. that you're getting data that reflects as well as possible what's there independently of the independently of the of the mm. machinery yeah i agree San, sandro go ahead please and, um, just a brief comment on this because uh, what i was meaning before was not to do like a sequence of measurement one after another because then yeah but have all this problem yeah you can do weak measurement but then you get less information so i was more thinking to repeat many experiment uh, so a series of, of experiments which finish at time t1, and you call that the statistic. Then another series of experiments which, which finish at time t1 plus epsilon, and you call that the statistic. 
and so on. And then one can study, for example, how long the coherences are surviving, at which time you essentially don't see any more interference effect, and you can say, okay, the pointer has collapsed uh, here or there. So, but yeah, otherwise I, I fully agree with Tim. Is yeah. a it's a problem. Uh, yeah, let me just make a comment about that. I mean, if, if again, this is going to be kind of theoretically depend on the theory you're working with, because if if you have a theory where the wave function is complete and you think you can con control it well in the initial state, um, then you could do this, this this many experiments and kind of compile them into yeah. you know in, in, into this picture you're looking for but in a bohmian case where in addition to the wave function you've got the particle positions each piece of data will also reflect the initial particle position so you won't really know how to take all that data and arrange it you know so it corresponds mm -hmm. to what any single particle would have done you're you're you, you'd kind of be getting outcomes from different initial conditions and you can't just kind of average over them um, because okay. the initial condition is the central role in the time development. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but there still remains the question. Like Sandra pointed out, uh, there's a calculation, I think Bassi and Doer perhaps, showing that once the quantum system arrives at the ready pointer state and an entangled state forms, how does this evolve over time so that one out, one part, psi one, which is the final outcome, starts growing exponentially, psi two decays. Why is this not measurable at all? Is what uh, I, I mean, I see what you're saying, but then we are also saying that Bassi et al. predicted something which cannot be measured. That looks a bit uh, surprising. Sandro? Um, well, let me, I mean, again, um, I don't know the work you're talking about. I can see that you could, in a collapse theory, like a GRW-like theory, certainly you can do a calculation for, on average, as the entanglement grows, and then the chances for the collapse on the entangled system grow, on average, you know, how, how, how the overall wave function will, will collapse. But... In in a Bohmian theory, of course, the wave function never collapses. There's yeah. a there's the collapse of the conditional wave function. You can calculate that if you know the trajectories. <laughs> but there's the whole point here is to get your hands on the trajectories, and and that's you know already the problem we're dealing with. So, um, you, you know, this is you're you're looking for even more sophisticated experiments yes. that would certainly. Yes. So I was trying to understand you the point that is it that. That is, in principle, the Bassi et al. prediction untestable. Is it untestable in principle or is it untestable because of technology? That uh, is yeah. what I'm not uh, fully clear about. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and look, that's always a hard question yeah. anyway, because if you ask I, the, what is the possible technology, that itself is a theoretical question. Absolutely. You know, I, that you, can, I, you can come up with some clever technology we never thought of that can give us yes. access we didn't know we could have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, for, I, me. I just, thanks for coming for this talk. <laughs> um, can I just request some small thing? Okay, there is a hand by someone, but I was, I mean, there are these three people here, Will, Ali, and Marcus, I mean, they are really arrival time experts here. I mean, I was hoping they would say something at some point. Is any of you welcome. We look, please, please do. Any of you yeah. want to bring the discussion back to arrival times? By sure. I'm happy to say something. I mean, I, I think um, to me, the sort of radical prediction here is about the non POVM statistics. So this is so if you look at the um, the the DOS DER experiment, if you think about the um, and you know uh, Shelley Goldstein and others have pointed this out recently, but if you look at these two, if you were to imagine an ensemble of sort of states that are up or down, or in the direction of the in the cylindrical direction versus the ensemble that are forward or backward, pointing along the axial directions. You're going to get different statistics out of those mixtures, and that's something that you can't get in the orthodox theory ever, or in anything that's described by a POVM. And the reason just comes down to the parallelogram law. 
So that's that's a really radical prediction, and it, the source Should of it, I think, contested for that reason. Sorry, it's deeply contentious for that. Yeah, reason. right, right, deeply contentious. So I think you know if. Um, in, for instance, the previous um, conversation about, you know, if you just look at Dirac flow lines, do you get the same prediction? Um, if the answer is yes, I say that that's great. I mean, that's another reason why this is a, a super interesting um, theoretical point that should be contested, whether POV of statistics are all there is. So I think, if, you know, whether it's Bohmian or not Bohmian is much less interesting than just what the prediction is here. Yeah, so the point hey, one was uh, the if this prediction is experimentally confirmed, say, could it tell us that, say, Bohmian mechanics is correct and quantum mechanics is not? Would they make different predictions? Well, I think in, in that case, I guess the, the orthodox theory just doesn't come to the table. It just doesn't make a prediction at all. So I think the streamline um, approach, if, if you think of that as sort of, um, you know, whatever that is, it's not an orthodox prediction. So the, the theory needs more resources to be able to make a prediction at all. So, I mean, it, you know, there's there's all these different predictions that Sadant mentioned, but um, uh, I think, yeah, just the basic question shouldn't really about be, be about theory choice. It's that um, nothing really comes to the table and creates a concrete prediction. And I think, mm. you know, another observation here that um, many people have noticed is that all the attempts to do so do so in a way that produces non-POVM statistics with a with a few asterisks that are technical, but um, I think that's you know a, a really interesting. Yeah, that, that's a very thing. important point you're making. That even those who manage to get a prediction, as you said, with minor exceptions, really violate this cherished thing about standard quantum mechanical predictions, the POVM structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what we are trying to understand is: is this a superior description of the same theory or is it a different theory that is a very uh, interesting easy to answer right i mean it's a different theory is easy to answer the answer is yes superior not depends on the mechanics is experimentally a different theory from quantum mechanics I guess the, the thing that I would emphasize here that, you know, I think gets missed is just that there's no, there's no prediction. There's no default prediction. So, that I mean, there's nothing it. sort of, so the, can't, can't can't the question there. Sorry. I mean, the moment you, you take that fact seriously, that there is not a single clear prediction coming from what's written in the quantum mechanics textbooks, given the standards of standard quantum mechanics that should answer your question no i agree i agree i'm just trying to go a step deeper is it that the fact that they are not able to calculate does that make it an incomplete theory to which there is need for new physics which you have uh, can, can i just make a comment here i mean i think yeah i and this is reflecting a bit what will was saying um, but also acknowledging what he's saying, which is this doesn't have to be about Bohmian mechanics in particular. Um, any theory that made these predictions would be making non-POVM predictions. And that means that the standard tools that are used in the quantum mechanics community would be incorrect, would just, they would fail to be able to deal with actual laboratory experiments. And one way to say this is that it's an odd thing to compare Bohmian mechanics to standard quantum mechanics, because standard quantum mechanics just isn't a theory in that sense. I mean, yes. you have a collapse postulate in it, and you haven't specified when a collapse occurs, or what a collapse is, or whatever, you you don't really have a theory that can be analyzed. You have yeah, so, so, so what we could ask you, a theory. Um, the fact the fact that the collapse postulate does make quantum mechanics is incomplete. Is that fact the same thing as the inability to calculate this phenomenon? Well, here it certainly is for this for the reasons Sid Hunt started out with, which is that if you just do a very ham-handed collapse postulate to eigenstates of a Hermitian operator, you don't have a Hermitian operator here. Yes. So that means you just don't have the tools. That's to a very important result of Alcock. Yeah, 
I really encourage people to look at his work. I mean, that's a very serious theorem. Um, so just to remind you, yeah, this is the name you should be searching with 1969, famous result. So, so to, make, to make it sharper, we want to say, here is an experiment whose outcome quantum theory is unable to explain. That is what makes theories incomplete, no? And the need to able to predict would just make them empirically, well, not not necessarily empirically wrong, but empirically inadequate. There's actual yes, yes. you have that the theory can't account. Yeah, you know, yes. can't predict, much less explain. You might think explain is a is a stronger thing than predict. Yeah, I can't predict. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, the experiment which disagrees with quantum mechanics. Well, we have to wait for the experiments, of course, and see what it even gives. But, I mean, for me, what's already quite nice, and for many people who work with these kind of Baumian trajectory resources, I mean, this suggests very interesting new experiments. Hmm. Uh, I, mean, I mean, that's already a lot coming at a time when you don't have experimental guidance and not even adequate awareness of this serious shortcoming. I mean, Detlef once wrote in one of our papers that, you know, you have 20 proposals. I mean, if you get sit back and forget the Baumian, non-Baumian discussion, you should be completely surprised that you quantum mechanics is the best tested theory of nature. He said, it surely deserves better. I mean, here we are having this debate, completely ignoring the fact that quantum physicists do not agree on what counts as a prediction for the experiments I talked about. That's just a fact. We yeah. can tell a long story about pointers. You know, you can go all the way till the end of Milky Way, leaving the theory behind. But what cannot be ignored is what's out there in the literature. And yeah. it's, it's just shocking that an experiment which is in the same quarter as double slit experiment in, in a certain sense. Mm. And the resources, as I said, you go you begin with experiment, you look into what they measure, you don't really see that they have to invent a new kind of gadget just because they have to measure arrival times. Not, not in any deep way. I mean, of course, they might want to make very you know, extraordinary femtosecond, picosecond technology, but that's just you know, engineering. Um, you know, the, the usual thing, you want better precision or whatever. But mm. I mean, if you, if you if you look at theory and experiment together, you have to be surprised. I I, 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 I agree with you. I agree with this you. This is disastrous. I mean, you have scattering theory as the sole working horse on which the S matrix formalism and everything stands. But every scattering experiment reports an arrival time distribution, which is ignored in you know daylight. Ask uh, even a professor, a graduate student who even have bothered to think. This can be sharpened and presented in the literature as here is some experiment as and when it gets done. Here is the result of an experiment which quantum theory is unable to explain. Hence, the theory needs modification. Well, bef before that, we are putting our energies into getting the experiments done. And depending on how these things turn out, I'm sure there will be a lot of people investing their energies into making these statements as acceptable as it can get at that point, right? Depending on which theory comes close to experiment. So we are really not in that stage to be making these judgments mm -hmm. as far as I see it. I mean, if some of these theories give you guidelines for a good experiment, which is how it already was even back in the day. I mean, think of the Bohr model. It totally inspired the stern gerlach experiment. The whole idea of, I mean, that experiment said nothing about those orbits in some explicit way, like you wanted to see the collapse happening in front of your eyes. Nobody saw those Bohr orbits. But because he suggested a radical theoretical move about quantization of angular momentum, it made people think what experiments they could do to see what its consequences are. That this theory boldly says that there are actual particles moving around. There's nothing to deny that. I mean, you can present the theory with potentials, torques, velocities, I mean, streamlines, what have you. As long as you know which curves you're talking about and know when the motion starts and finishes, it's quite clear 
what like these kind of theories suggest very good experiments and i have presented mm. one such and ali is present among us i don't know if you would like to talk but he and collaborators have also presented some very good experiments again using these resources and not trying to guess at a quantum observable so at this stage it doesn't say that that's wrong or this is better but for a theorist these are great opportunities and mm. I don't know if Ali would like to comment about some of. Is he still here? I saw him. On, he's still there. Uh, he's showing in the list. Burn, do you want to go ahead? Thank you. Um, so first, one comment. So, um, do you know the work of Günther Ludwig in Germany on the foundations of quantum mechanics? So Ludwig. I have heard the name, but... Uh... Okay, because uh, he was quite aware of the uh, time of arrival problem already in the 1970s. He also and... discussed the momentum measurements, isn't it correct? Sorry? Did he also discuss the momentum measurements? No, name uh, sound? not that I'm aware of. So I think it was only the time measurements, not the momentum. Maybe he used also momentum to, um, uh, well, give information about time. But I would have to look this up to uh, be sure whether this is... The correct data is quite good. Um, I'm more interested in uh, the fact that you said that this is uh, ah, his network is unstable. So Mr. Ayat is here, but his network is unstable. Okay. Uh, you can chime in if your network becomes stable again, then you can interrupt me, okay? Uh, so, um, okay, so, so the, the most fascinating, well, first of all, something uh, I forgot uh, was my first comment, a very good structured, very interesting and fascinating talk and uh, with many interesting insights. But uh, what I found, but maybe it's not my, my personal opinion, most interesting is that you said that you make predictions which cannot be covered by a positive operator while it measures. Because the, the idea were for uh, yeah. PoEVMs was that this is the most general uh, statistics you can get if you stay uh, well in the, in the quantum mechanical formalism. And um, yeah, as already mentioned uh, earlier, if this is correct, then you would have shown that quantum mechanics is incomplete. Not only that there's a better theory, you would uh, demonstrate that the theory is simply incomplete. If it makes no predictions for the situations, then we have a, we have an experimental accessible situation where quantum mechanics just fails in a sense because it cannot make any predictions or the correct predictions. Uh, the next question is: um, You will get some kind of probability distribution if it's not a PoVM. On which kind of space does it live? So is in a Hilbert space, or where? Uh, on which kind of space is the uh, distribution defined? I mean, probability distribution, I mean... Yeah, yeah, yeah the probability distribution, where, how is it defined? On which kind of space is it defined? On which kind of measure space? So this is the correct oh. I mean... I, yeah, anybody who knows can answer. Uh, sure, I, yeah, because, I can uh, take that. I mean, okay, it's, ahead. it's, that's, it's that's your area. It's still defined on the same. I mean, it's still defined on the projective Hilbert space. You still have a recipe that takes in a uh, projective Hilbert space and gives you a probability distribution over time, but the recipe is not via a POVM. So, you, so okay, then you're... I have to uh, sharpen my question. So, how do you calculate then the probabilities? Well, so in this example, it, it's because um, that was the probability was defined in this step here. Ah. It's like how you would define the probability density of a random variable. That's it's a function of some base random variable. Ah, okay, okay. So it's uh, unfortunately it doesn't turn. So like Will said, and what I took it to be is it's doesn't have this bilinearity with respect to the state, like the POV. It does not have what kind of linearity? It's not bilinear. Bilinear. Ah, bilinearity. Okay. Oh, that's even more fascinating. But, That's exactly uh, why this POVM statistics are getting. Yeah, the POVM so, uh, is, uh, is defined to be a B linear. I, I, so, yes, yes, yes. I okay. Guess, uh, I guess you see how where that comes from. You see, this stuff is, of course, bilinear. But this TF, R0, which is defined through the Bohmian trajectories, is not mm -hmm. bilinear because the Bohmian trajectories are defined by a guiding equation which uses the wave function in a normal. Ah, so, thank you very much. This really clarified. Uh, 
what I wanted to know. This is really interesting. So you have a non-bilinear distribution. Well, I, I think time is running out, but uh, so I will stop now. Uh, only two things. Uh, can one contact you and can I have your slides with all of the references? Yeah, I can uh, I can this email you nice. slides and if you drop your IP in the chat. We have been here for, I think, over two hours now, so I will not uh, prolong the discussion, but I would really like to learn more about this non-bilinear uh, probability distribution. So maybe I can contact you or Mr. Cavendish. Uh, this is really fascinating. So I would really like to learn more about this. Uh, okay. And can and, I just uh, say quickly, Bernd, uh, of course, if you do want to contact uh, Sidant, um, the whole reason we have the Osmo chat room is to allow people to continue bilateral discussions of papers, of talks. Ah, okay. So feel free to use that. Just let me know. And, yes, uh, then I will I'll, invite you. Uh, okay. So that you can continue to chat uh, and exchange on that uh, via that medium. And that way we've got a continuing kind of record of the discussions, which is, okay, yeah. which is good. Yeah, that would be great. Sorry to interrupt. Then. Yeah. I just wanted to add one quick comment for you. So yes. even though in general, this is going to be non-bilinear in the wave function. I mean, that's quite clear. But what's remarkable is that in most cases that it's usually been looked at, and I, I was saying that in the next slide with the scattering stuff, it reduces to something bilinear. I mean, of course, this is a special circumstance. And what I was presenting as an example is a, a certain realistic experiment where this bilinearity gets screwed um, in a somewhat unexpected way, let's say. This is really interesting because this is one of the main axiomat uh, part of the axioms of quantum theory that your probability distributions have to be bilinear. Uh, yeah. As, mon as some people who uh, listened to my talk one week ago know this was one of the basic axioms that there were many ideas to go beyond this already by the pioneers of quantum theory. That's why I'm so uh, fascinated by your approach and would like to learn more about it. That's also, by the way, the reason many people would say this stuff is not measurable, because for them, bilinearity serves as a criterion of measurability. Yes. Uh, as I said, I don't want to uh, prolong the discussion uh, because we have been talking here, but uh, there are also ideas to go beyond bilinearity uh, uh, if you go beyond Hilbert space on more general Banach spaces. There are lots of non-bilinear observable so structures which resemble in some sense, uh, okay, you don't like operators, but they resemble operators. They're not operators themselves, but they have a non-bilinear composition. So that's why I, I was uh, also asking whether your probability distribution is defined on a Hilbert space, because there's, well, many more opportunities for non-bilinearity if you go beyond Hilbert space. Okay, this is something I'm not aware of. I have to ask you further. Maybe uh, that's why I wanted to start an exchange because uh, yeah, I, hope I, I will. Can... I'll write to you and send the slides, and then we can. Okay. We uh, can... Are you still based in Munich? Yeah, yeah, I'm still in. Because Munich. I'm also based in Munich, that should uh, greatly simplify uh, <laughs> communication. Let's we'll meet here. Yeah, yeah, let's meet. Maybe that's helpful. That, yeah. that would be good. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, Those were nice comments. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, so, so now I'm done. Sorry, Michael. You want to say some closing remarks? Yeah. Yes. Surely. Uh, well, only just to thank Sidant for um, this has already been said, but um, and really very very clear, beautifully organised talk, which has raised, as I think this last exchange with Burnt has made very clear, some some very very deep questions indeed um it's uh, it's opened some fascinating new perspectives um as well as being in its own kind of self-contained terms a very very interesting study of uh, what i think i completely agree deserves to be a much more central question uh it is extraordinary the way that this has been sidelined um when you consider the amount of thought that's got into discussions about the testability of claps and you know, other other topics i i completely agree with you um and uh, thank you again very much not only for yeah, getting the whole store on the experimental us. proposal but also as i say highlighting just how deep the theoretical ramifications of this uh, this discussion go thanks again yeah i very much hope that it gets more mainstream yes uh, definitely the beautiful talk one of the nicest talks we have had in osmo here 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 don't Come imagine on. how nervous i was <laughs> no, it didn't no? show. It didn't show. Yeah, I only, yeah. I only saw clarity. Yes. 
Well, don't worry about being nervous. It, it's people who are not nervous who give. Thanks for that calls. comment. I mean, that was yeah, that was a big deal. Being clear. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Very, very, clear. very clear talk. We'll go back Fantastic. and listen to the recordings. Definitely. Yes, well, we'll get this online as soon as we can, Siddhant. I hope within the next week. So, so we'll meet yeah. two weeks from now, and we have a very interesting talk coming up. Subir Sarkar. Uh, the title is: Is the standard model of cosmology being challenged? by new observations. So that should be very interesting too. We hope to see you uh, the next talk. Thank you very much indeed. All the best to everybody. Yeah. See you Thanks, again soon. Dan. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks Maybe. to everybody for a wonderful, as I say, real intellectual feast today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night.